The name of my um, paper is, as you can see, Advertising Industry Imperialism. And I'm going to show a bunch of slides and talk about the slides and try to make some generalizations. Now, this piece of, uh, of this presentation comes out of a uh, book manuscript. And <clears throat> it's just a really small part of a general argument. The general argument is, um, the, the book is called In the Event of Women, and the book argues that Alain Badiou's theory of the event can be used to think about the historical event of women. Uh, this was a piece, um, Calvin, Calvin was at uh, a presentation where I gave a more elaborated version of this argument. Two, the contemporary historical method and historical ephemera must be reevaluated in the light of theories of the event. Third, the historical subject of women in China's Judy Court era reached historical legibility, and that's going to be a big issue for me in this presentation, historical legibility, as a commodity defined individual. Fourth, that a significant avenue to demonstrating the event of woman is precisely ephemera. And that's where the book and this presentation over now. Um, uh, finally, the book ends with a discussion of a political con uh, conflict between Wang Bang Mei and Zhang Qing over what is the proper uh, presentation of womanhood uh, and I argue that this actually is uh, fidelity to the event of women which happened decades before that. So it ends a kind of period, a new kind of period. So basically my point um, here throughout the project and in this presentation is that when we study ephemera, we actually do change the way that history um, is assumed to work what causes historical change, how people are related to the conditions for thinking that lead them to act in certain ways. So while my draft is about um, a, a philo philosophic problem, my pertinence today really is that uh, the claim that ephemera provides evidence of historical events. And that's my starting point. Um, now, I have to make a disclosure. This leads to a lot of conflict. In my book, I do make the argument. Um, I propose that Yen Hu's vision of modern society is supported in a failed advertising campaign for New York brand cigarettes. So I make a ludicrous assumption about uh, advertising campaign and high philosophy because Yen Hu is, after all, a philosopher and a scholar, whereas advertising is a junk. Basically, I do make an argument that an um, advertisement for Colgate dental ribbon dentifrice, that's a kind of toothpaste, uh, supports Pan Guangdan's psychodynamic theory of female narcissism, which in fact we can read upon. He has a huge number of books, very significant intellectual figure. But um, my point here is that in the visual culture of advertising ephemera, we see the presuppositions and the conditions upon which Pan could legitimately argue that Chinese women are by nature narcissistic. And I do know that in advertising campaigns for sincere department store, um, we see further evidence for theories about social evolution, which are, of course, Darwinian and were very serious theoretical concerns. So um, I caution you that some of this presentation and even the book itself is tongue in cheek. Um, but I do seriously believe that the ephemeral world the world of Beninian small things have a now embedded in them. And that it's at this level we see forms of historical causality. In today's presentation, I'm going to um, focus in on, um, let me get this forward. Yes, okay. I'm going to focus in on the process of branding and brand marking. I'm going to start with a short introduction to what is currently known about Chinese advertising industry. Uh, and I might add that there are more and more books now coming out um, from the PRC and Chinese scholars doing the heavy work of collecting um, advertising images in relation to specific newspapers, journals, and so on. So there's more and more secondary source for me to, um, to work with. Um, uh, I'm going to make an adverse point, however, using this kind of research. I'm going to argue that trademark semiotics, and I'll explain how trademarking took place. Trademark semiotics do the opposite of connect to the nation. That is, trademark and trademarking and the images themselves 
do not represent region, orthography, national origin, or national capital. Indeed, trademarking and the advertisements that bore the trademarks rarely represent a nation. Rather, they consolidate around commodities that come to market um, advertising and representing to the general public, anybody who sees them, a kind of positive, feminizing, sexualized cosmopolitanism. The ephemera that I'm drawing on today come from a number of sources. Uh, one of them is, um, probably you're all aware of the existence of these manuals. These are Guomindang Government National Archive Registration Records. I uh, was fortunate enough to find a, 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 a lot of them at the University of Washington Library. They're relatively rare, um, and I'll speak about them in a little bit. Um, but the um, ephemera I draw on uh, are from this kind of registration process, but also from uh, Tianjin and um, Shenyang, uh, where I look, I have done extensive research in Tianjin Sa Dagongbao and uh, Shenyang's uh, Shangjingbao. For those of you who are not familiar with this, these are treaty ports or treaty port-like entities. Uh, Shenyang was uh, very close to Dalian, which was a treaty port. Um, and these are the major commercial uh, newspapers in these areas, both of them the Japanese-owned and the, and the uh, multiply Chinese-owned uh, newspapers um, published the news um, in an unbiased way. These were both really good newspapers. It's not because Japanese-owned means Japanese slanted. Um, these are very good, reputable newspapers. However, I was very much interested in them because of their advertising policies. Um, also, I want to stress that these are areas with multiple population groups, particularly in the Northeast, which would be called Manchuria under the Japanese. We see a range of different ethnicities as well as migrants, um, both Japan, almost a million Japanese settled in this area, as well as Korean Japanese laborers who were active um, as, uh, as indentured laborers. Um, also, I'm going to look at imperialist corporations from uh, registered um, or identified with specific nations. A Japanese corporation um, called Jintan, another one, Nakayama, a, a so-called English corporation called Brunner Mon, and you see Brunner Mon, uh, this is the Chinese name for Brunner Mon, uh, the American BAT, British American Tobacco Company, um, and I'm going to show how these corporations, not just their ads, but the corporation organization themselves, were multinational. In other words, we don't see a, a complete alignment between the own, so-called alleged ownership of Brunner Mohn and the English state. Things are far more complex than that, and my general argument is that through ephemera, we see the complexity. So it's much more difficult to categorize things in neat packages like nation, state, culture, and so on. All right. Let me talk a little bit about advertisers and their work. Now, um, we talk about the Chinese advertising industry, and it's very important to make sure from the very beginning, um, and this is something that Zhu Shui, a, a historian in China, has, has published on recently and at great length. Um, the introduction of advertising theory into um, the Chinese advertising industry came through the United States, but the industry itself was Chinese only in the sense that it was happening in China. So the Chinese advertising industry was composed of Chinese operatives, people teaching advertising theory, but also of Japanese, English, American, Russian, French, and other advertising entities which um, all registered their materials um, with any government that they could find at the time. Um, now, the characteristic of Chinese Chinese advertisement appears to have been that it is considered a theory, that it is a logos rather than a practice. Um, this is a controversial and interesting statement, but it will help me to explain why in the competition that we see in advertisements themselves, foreign uh, manufactured goods and foreign company advertisements far outweigh local or Chinese created, Chinese oriented, 
Chinese advertisements for Chinese commodities. Um, <clears throat> in Chinese advertising history, from the very start, nationals worked side by side with foreign operatives to found the industry. In other publications, I have established the existence of a U.S.-oriented group of expatriate and U.S.-educated Chinese advertising agents um, who work together in the Shanghai advertising world to create an industry. I underscore again that these were expatriates by and large. So we have a Chinese market, but the advertising agents and industry is multinational from the very, very beginning. Um, now, one of the theories about uh, this entity, particularly in Shanghai, suggests that um, the foreign nationals outcompeted local Chinese-based uh, advertisers. I won't go into the reasons why that happened, but I will note that um, in uh, um, a sample that I took from two very important um, journals of opinion, Dong Pan Zhi and Fu Li Zhi. What we see over the years 1925 to 1931 is this steep rise in the number of foreign advertisements for foreign commodities, non-Chinese commodities. Um, so that the ratio by 1931 is 88% transnational advertisements to 12% Chinese advertisements, and we'll see how difficult it is to say what is the difference between Chinese and transnational, but I think in terms of commodity and the sources of the advertisements, it is possible. Um, now, I'm not claiming that um, internationally branded products outsold Chinese products. I can't make that claim, and I don't think on the basis of ephemera we have uh, purchased for making that kind of claim. All we can say is that in the advertising industry, what we find is both products and the production of the advertisements themselves favor foreignness and achieve a kind of foreign flavor that reinforces the power of commodification. So if you want to be a certain kind of person, and use Pond's cold cream instead of the local knockoff, you are going to gravitate towards foreign representations, foreign brands, etc., etc., which make claims about being more hygienic, more modern, more progressive, and so on. Um, so I do want to make sure that you understand I'm not making claims about actual sales figures. All right, let's see how um, uh, trademarks and trademarking existed. In order to understand trademarks and trademarking, we have to go into the question of extraterritoriality. Because trademarking and branding law did not exist before the uh, treaty ports were opened, and law, extraterritorial law, declared that branding meant that a corporation owned a certain hybrid. That is to say, the corporation owned the product, but it also had to register with a government of some sort in order to own the hieroglyph that represents the product that's being produced in the market and makes it a certain kind of product. This raises the question of what is law under colonialism. Recently, in US-generated research, there's a real interest in how extraterritorial law operated. But we, we know from histor Chinese historian Zhou uh, Xu Chu that um, it's very difficult, because there are so many laws that are passed at this time, it is difficult to know which one was actually a powerful law, and which one was the law that was enforced by whatever government happened to be in power at that time. We do know eventually that the nationalist government established the law um, in a certain way, and so when corporations registered with, in this sort of way, it was toward the Kuomintang government or the national, the Republic of China. Um, in Zhuo's uh, chronology, he chooses political events as a way of explaining the power of the law and the resonance of the law, so that when registration took place, um, there was some sort of meaning attached to it. But he also has um, uh, noted that um, uh, Chinese-based companies that were not directly competing with 
transnationals um, did not use branding practices. They tended not to use branding, but rather packaging. So there is a surge of what we might call modernization or commercialization or commodification in these markets, but it's not always brand oriented. Let me go back to the actual how of branding, having clarified that not all new products actually have a brand on them. Here in this series of illustrations, we get to know how corporations, in this case Bruner Mall, registered every element of their brand. Now this meant that they were claiming the legal right to each element of the advertisement. This goes back to some of the early discussion of repetition and clarification, generic qualities. Um, and we end up, this is the famous crescent moon for Brunner Moon. These are variations. Notice that each one is being trademarked in combination. And here we have the combination of the whole. Now I couldn't find, I, I own a, an iteration of this kind of painting. It's not as good as this one, and I, I had thought to bring it, but I couldn't find it this morning. So when Brunner Mohn actually put an advertisement together, they used all of the elements that they had originally trademarked. Um, so we see that trademarking had different kinds of dimensions and importance. So if we want to understand what this painting or this uh, uh, image means, we need to know about trademarking and some of the political and economic um, uh, qualities or strangeness. Um, I have um, uh, now this Brunner Mohn Corporation is also um, uh, known as ICI, uh, Imperial Chemical Industries, and it's still in business to this day. Um, the um, probably, I mean, as Anne's presentation also pointed out, the political instability at the time was highly pronounced, and so. Um, it may also be that corporations were trying to stabilize their brand marks. But I'm going to show you a series of images of, uh, for Standard Oil of New York. Um, and these you can find scattered throughout all of the different media. You can see here that they're trying to associate modernist marks with their Soconi brand. Um, Uh, the same uh, also traced um, uh, Ford, Ford motor car. We can see exactly the same thing going on here. Um, but there are also um, images that appear in the um, in the trademark uh, world, which actually are trademarking in uh, products that haven't been created yet. That is to say, um, there'll be a series of names. Uh, trademark and an image attached to the name, but in all my years of looking through these journals, I have never seen these products. My the implication here is that they were charting future markets by trademarking and branding into the future. This is a form of market making, whether it's legal or not. This is a constant, repetitive effort to establish in the landscape what the future is going to look like under conditions of massive commodification. Okay. Um, now I'm going to skip uh, forward a bit showing you um, some of the, uh, the marvelous um, uh, possibilities here. Um, the, um, I want to note uh, um, uh, I'll, okay, let's see if I can go back here. Um, uh, it's important to be very clear that when we look at an advertisement, unless we have seen the trademark and the branding pattern, we may not understand the nationality of the corporation. All right, here what we see is um, uh, one thing and <laughs> what it is is another. That is, this is an ad for, or a trademark for a British company. Um, and 
what we uh, the next one uh, Washington is a trademark for a Japanese company. The point I'm making here is that in trademarking we see a disjuncture between cliché and nationality. There is no direct, you cannot make the assumption that a Chinese style brand or trademark or trademarking practice belongs to a Chinese company. And this is one of the most important things I think that ephemera can do for us. Uh, let's take Novanol. This is another um, Japanese product. There's not one word of Japanese in this product. You would think that it was a British product because it has a British sounding chemical name. Um, there are many, many reasons why. This again is a Japanese company. All right, this is a Caucasian um, toddler and um, it's advertised in Chinese. But unless you look at the trade marking, you don't know that this is an actual Japanese uh, company. Um, again, you would think that this might be a Chinese company, but in fact it is not. It is um, a French company, Optor uh, Corporation, still um, actually in existence, which traded in Russian goods, uh, was um, originally actually a Russian multinational or uh, uh, colonial conglomerate. The trademarking records show the advertising, uh, advertising, branding, or owning um, allegedly national styles of visual representation. Now, this is crazy because this is the story of Menches, right? I don't know how much more Chinese you could possibly get than this series of things, which have absolutely nothing to do with China or Chinese, um, except for the fact that they're being owned by a government are representing corporate entities which are not, not at all Chinese. I'll give you, because of the, in the interest of time, um, and there are other things I want to get to, I'll point out that even national products, these are allegedly Chinese produced, Chinese products for Chinese patriotic consumers, what we find is a very mixed bag. There's no way um, graphically to represent in a cartoon figure the Chineseness of a Chinese Chinese person, right? That's part of the problem with visual recognition. The race of a person becomes very difficult to decipher. Not only that, um, anyone can copyright, as we know now, virtually anything. DNA um, can now be copyrighted or owned by conglomerates. So. Um, in this case, I simply give you more and more instances in this ephemeral archive. Nobody paid attention to this. There was no way to enforce this uh, during this period in, in, the, in the Chinese 20th century. But here it is, claiming ownership over core mythology, core images, and so on. Here are the, um, the examples of uh, products that that I've looked for, these are trademark products, but I have never seen um, an image or an actual advertisement. Um, these are fake products or future products. Um, in the, tra the Trademark Gazette and Trademark Registration absorbed the energies of many colonial entrepreneurs and imperialist uh, corporate lawyers like Norwood Allman, um, and uh, Allman uh, and others have been studied um, fairly extensively. It would appear that advertising agents and people who created this system were not just fictively um, imperialists, they were also, because of the trade they were involved in, they were also spying for um, various entities, including governments. So the communication network that um, uh, um, a lawyer might establish allowed him to feed back information to various governments about uh, the situation for selling in markets, but also for competition among, among uh, different corporations. Now, so far the argument has noted that nation and brand did not align in so-called Chinese advertising industry. Um, actually, non-alignment applies to the corporation as well, and I'm going to be even briefer here uh, than I have been before. Um, when you examine, when you take the ephemera and start investigating an advertisement, 
the first thing you have to do is find out what company is being is creating the advertisement. When you start doing that, you move from ephemera back into the history uh, business, that is corporate history. And what you find, what I have found, is that corporations themselves in these markets were um, of various kinds. I have the example first of Amco, um, which um, was a Danish operation, which was registered its corporation um, in the United States um, uh, in order to avoid certain problems with corporate law and taxation. You can find Amco style. Um, Amco actually introduced General Electric Corporation into the Chinese market. So it was an extremely powerful corporation. It still exists, as does GE. Um, when you look uh, at Brunner Mohn, for example. This is a British company, right? Except that the British were investing uh, in their Japanese counterparts around the same time that Brunner Mohn was launching its uh, Chinese mainland campaign. And from the very beginning, it was established to campaign on the China mainland. Um, it was also investing money in Japan. Now, eventually, this Sino or this um, Anglo Japanese entity ended up competing in the China market because it was much easier to make profit over there, and the corporate structure became much stronger um, because of mutual investment in these transnational corporations. Hunter and Sugiyama have uh, demonstrated the cross-fertilization of capital into these entities. So we have Amco on the one side, which is non-national. We have Brunner Mond on the other hand, which appears to be binational or, or transnational in the way that it's organized. Then we have Japanese corporations, which I've also studied um, extensively, and these are Osaka-based tailorists, that is American style, aggressive corporations which are nationalist and they they are collaborating directly with the imperialist um, project in Japan and are a kind of front for Japanese aggression but importantly even these people were profit driven so there are extensive and this is an example of one of the more important ones these people are both driven for um, uh, profit, but also to make sure that a pan-Asian market exists. Now, you can't get there, it seems to me, without going through a camera. Because, look at that map up there. Uh, those of you who are China-based, China historians and so on, you know that this map is an example of the Japanese effort to create the, the Trans-Siberia Trans, -Siberia, trans uh, um, Railway, and the association of femininity with railway imperialist projects is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It sells to Japanese residents of this area. Um, it's properly trademarked, <laughs> um, so we can find issues. It's trademarked in the Chinese way. And um, uh, it, like other Japanese corporations, <laughs> had brilliant advertising campaigns. Now this is, this is one of my favorite because, um, and I really have to wind up, um, Japanese corporations of this type were very careful about advertising. They needed to create local cosmopolitanisms, and particularly in the areas that Jap Japan colonized because they were multinational. Um, Japanese corporations and newspapers tended to create a local style of the it girl. Uh, this is a, a Manchurian girl, and I studied different markets um, which produce different versions of the it girl. Uh, this is also just brilliant advertising. It's absolutely wonderful advertising. Um, repetitive and yet familiar, fun, uh, commodity oriented. <laughs> From Jacob to Shay. Now, Again, with the Brunner Mont um, advertisement, in this particular advertisement, we see all of the elements of this Nakayama Tayodo um, uh, corporation um, charming uh, made in Pai. So, 
um, it's the same process, it's just a different kind of corporation. Now, I show these because I also, along with Alida um, and Patricia and others, uh, think that repetition is a very important part of the life of ephemera. Repetition and um, what I call ban banalization, that is to make advertisements such a part of the lived world that um, it's banal and nobody even notices it. Whether there's a car in front of it or not is really immaterial because it's a part of the, the place where people live and so they they psychologically they just fill in the parts that are covered up by the car. Um, um, this is just another icon, uh, a different kind of icon. I'm going to use this, I have five more minutes or this is the last? Okay. Um, I'm going to take two minutes and be a bad citizen. Um, the Japanese tradition of advertising has its own history, and I've published on how it is that Japanese industry, like the English and the American industry, as well as the Chinese-Chinese industry, how they organized and what sorts of inspirations they sought in this transnational world. Um, now, I'd like to close by making a couple of points about what I call the icon. And that is precisely um, the girl. Uh, in other advertising traditions, it's going to be slightly different. Um, and uh, I think that this really is a, a, a huge problem for me. And it seems like uh, for recognition of repeating motifs, this is a general problem for all of us, how to um, recognize what is being repeated and why. Um, and I've been drawing on uh, Laura Mulvey uh, for inspiration about what iconicity is and why it's so central um, to the landscape of advertising. We can discuss that privately. I have leaned on Scott McCloud, um, who is a theorist of, of uh, cartoons. And he's made arguments about the ways in which the fewer strokes or the fewer, fewer lines you use, the more powerfully universal the cartoon image uh, will be. And he defines the icon as any image used to represent a person, place, thing, or idea. And this resonates as well with what Alida was talking about. Finally, I'm uh, very much drawn to the um, semiotics of Charles Peirce. Um, uh, because in this in this theory of rep well, it's not representation, but in this theory of semiotics, um, Pierce actually um, assumes bodilyness, so that um, this is not just representation. This is not representation. It's not the image and its representation. Rather, it's the sensorium and the assumption. Um, that he makes and that I've tried to work into my own work is that um, bodies inhabit these spaces and they become habituated um, through the sensorium. This is reflected in the theories of the Japanese advertising operative uh, who was operating in Dongbei um, trying to sell Japanese products to Chinese women. And he also notes that the most important part of selling has got to be the sensorium. Thank you.